Have we been lied to about fiber? Is big fiber out to convince us that we need it to poop? Well, there may be something to it all. If you were to ask Dr. Paul Mason, maybe not quite that dramatically, but maybe we've been overblowing the importance of fiber. So without further ado, let's hear what Dr. Mason has to say on the topic, and then we'll cross-reference with the science to date. So Paul, welcome back once again. Great to be here again. We're going to have a little bit of a more controversial topic today around fiber because I know for eons we've been, you know, told the importance of, you know, intake of soluble and insoluble fiber. But you've got some different viewpoints to share with us. Yeah, this was absolutely astonishing for me, Joe. Earlier this year, I was looking at the literature. I was writing, uh, writing a chapter for a textbook, and I was looking at the evidence on fiber intake. And what I found was that the, the evidence is totally at odds with what our common beliefs are, uh, conventional wisdom or guidelines, what have you, that fibre is necessary for good gut health and that it's the best and most optimal treatment for constipation is not borne out when we actually look at the literature. Well, I don't know about you, but colour me interested, the importance of fibre does not bear out in the science. Okay, I'm in. Let's hear it. So, and I think probably the easiest way to think about it, we can think about it logically in a couple of ways to start with. So I'm sure some of the viewers will have heard of malabsorption syndrome. Um, they come in several different formats, but essentially if you eat something that is not able to be digested by your body or absorbed in the intestines, then it ends up transiting right down to the distal colon where all the, the bugs that form the microbiome live. And those bacteria will then ferment a, uh, a particular food source, and in the process they'll produce gas. And we associate that with bloating and several other symptoms. Now, that's exactly the way that fibre works. He's absolutely right. Fibre is a non-digestible carbohydrate. It gets taken up by the microbes within our intestines and is an active nutrient for those bacteria which convert the fiber molecule into other molecules that do have an effect on our eukaryotic cells. So fiber is a non-digestible carbohydrate. So when we eat it, it doesn't get absorbed across our intestines. It transits all the way through. And when it gets fermented by the bacteria, we produce gas and we produce bloating. And there's been an awful amount of literature that has shown that increased levels of fibre intake are associated with significant disturbances of Gauss function. You get constipation, you get bloating, people just generally don't feel very well. Hmm, okay. I wouldn't deny that the consumption of fiber can lead to these issues. Actually, speaking to that, my roommate back in college made the extremely uncomfortable mistake of relying too heavily on a particular protein bar packed with substantial dietary fiber. He really blasted through the box in a day or two and ultimately found himself doubled over trying to figure out why he was in so much pain. Ultimately, because we both tracked our nutrition religiously, we were able to trace it back to these new bars that he had bought for himself. And sure enough, he'd consumed something north of 80 grams of fiber in quick order. But we aren't here to discuss anecdotes. We're here to discuss science. So what does the science say? Unfortunately, the science seems to disagree heartily with Dr. Mason. For example, a small meta-analysis looking at randomized control trials wherein participants were given a fiber supplement or a placebo, that's a fake supplement, showed an increase in stool frequency. Otherwise stated, an improvement in the ability to use the bathroom. We can see that the overall effects diamond moves to the right in favor of supplementation and there is no heterogeneity between studies, indicating good consistency across studies. This is also excluding multiple studies that were poorly designed, something to keep in mind for later. Hint, hint. Now, granted, the meta-analysis consisted of only five studies, and other metrics like stool consistency did not show improvements, but they also didn't show any worse results which would be expected if Dr. Mason's point were correct. Still, we needn't stop there. Another meta-analysis of 16 randomized control trials indicated even better results, 
likely because of the larger sample of studies, indicating that fiber supplementation improved constipation. So while my anecdote about my poor roommate who did survive his blunder may have indicated that Dr. Mason was correct, there are many studies that indicate the opposite. Still, his next point is a strong one. And on the other side of the coin, I said, well, what happens if you don't have any fiber? You know, what happens to your gut health then? Because we were always told how important it is for our gut health. And there's only been one experimental study that I could find that looked at the symptoms of constipation and compared high and low fiber diets. And it's not a randomized controlled trial because unfortunately there is zero randomized controlled trials on this topic. So we just had to settle for, uh, it was still an experimental design. And they took people who had what's called idiopathic constipation, which means, uh, which is like the constipation that my patients will walk in with. We're not 100% sure of the cause, but we certainly know they're constipated. And we put, put those patients on varying diets and they range from high fibre diets down to zero fibre diets. So that's no fibre at all. Mm -hmm. And in every single one of the patients on the zero fibre diets, they had complete 100% resolution of all symptoms of their constipation. Bleeding, bloating, strain opening the bowels. So it, there were six symptoms and they all completely resolved. And the frequency of bowel actions on the people on the zero fibre diet, and there was 41 people in this group, was exactly one bowel action per day, every day. And the frequency of bowel action in the group on the highest fibre diet, one bowel action every 6.83 days. And that to date is the only experimental design that has ever looked at changing the amount of fibre in the diet on symptoms of constipation. Okay, so he's referring to this study. I know that because he mentions it in one of his lectures. Anyway, like Dr. Mason mentioned, the study isn't a randomized control trial, but let's roll with it anyway. Funny enough, I covered this study in one of my live sessions with the Physionic Insiders. Someone requested that I cover it, and uh, here it is again. So fortunately, I didn't need to read it again. Okay, so he's right about the results. Those that stopped consuming fiber cleared up all of their constipation symptoms, as we can see here. On the left, we have all of the symptoms. Certainly not pleasant. There were 63 participants in the study and all of them were suffering from some form of constipation symptom. Then further on the right, we have the three fiber conditions. Those that maintained a high fiber diet, those that reduced their fiber intake but continued to eat some, and those that completely eliminated it. After six months, those on the high fiber diet all had constipation symptoms considering there were six total participants in that group and all six still suffered in one way or another. The reduced fiber group had 16 people in it and some of them did experience relief considering only 12 still had constipation, for example. And finally, 41 individuals stopped fiber altogether. And those zeros there are an indication of how effective that was. Actually, here's Dr. Paul Mason getting really excited about the result. And what you can see here is that those on the reduced fibre diet actually demonstrated a modest reduction in symptoms. So the question is, what happened to those, the majority of those in the study, who had zero fibre in their diet? This is not a mistake. I didn't just forget to put something in the slide there. <laughs> now, not one patient on the zero fibre diet had any symptoms. That's quite astonishing, really. But unfortunately, there are some issues with this study that aren't being brought up. First, the participants were already consuming a high fibre diet, but there are no reports on what high fibre means no numbers. Additionally, the high fiber and low fiber conditions were not defined. So are we talking about 100 grams of fiber and 20 grams of fiber or 50 and 10? Your guess is as good as mine. There are also no data on the overall nutrition nor many other characteristics of these participants. 
Bottom line, this study isn't well designed and has more than one or two issues with it. That said, I'm not saying I don't believe the results, but I think that the argument against fiber should be more strongly put together than using a single ill-designed study when there's more research indicating the exact opposite. But let's hear Dr. Mason out once more before I get into that evidence. Now, there are other studies out there that will look at uh, what we call fecal bulking or transit time. Now, so we do know that adding fibre will make the faeces bigger, but is that necessarily a good thing? If we think about constipation as having trouble pushing something through a small hole, a sphincter as you will, then adding fibre to bulk out the faeces makes no more sense than adding cars to clear a traffic jam. It's just really illogical. And certainly that's been borne out by the evidence. He certainly sounds like he's making a lot of sense here. I mean, I'd certainly agree that putting more cars in a traffic jam doesn't help the situation, but that's not exactly what's happening with fiber. Fiber isn't merely adding bulk to the stool. It changes the makeup of the stool. So as explained in this scientific review, fiber does increase the bulk of the stool, adding weight to it and thereby mechanically irritating the colon to, in a sense, eject the stool due to its irritation. A second mechanism is in its ability to hydrate the stool. It traps and encourages the buildup of water in the stool, which acts to soften the stool and make it easier to pass. So if we go back to our traffic jam analogy, uh, if the cars can turn into blobs and squeeze by one another like Flubber or the Terminator, it isn't a great comparison in this biological example. And then I thought, so I was reading this and I thought, but we're told about the other benefits of fibre, that it leads to the production of the short chain fatty acids, the butyric acids and these kind of things, and they nourish the cells that line our colon. And that is absolutely true. You do produce those and they get absorbed. These short chain fatty acids get absorbed by the cells that line the colon. But here's the thing, they then get converted to ketones and the ketones then provide sufficient energy for these cells that line our colon to produce a, a healthier mucus layer and other things. So in effect, the state of nutritional ketosis, somebody on a ketogenic diet is going to be getting all the benefits of these ketones. And not only that, they get it without the side effects of bloating. And rather than being uh, only applied to some of the cells lining our colon in a, in a small area where they're produced, these ketones, when you're in systemic ketosis, can be supplied to all the cells lining the intestine, right from the mouth, right through to the anal sphincter. There's a lot here. Again, Dr. Mason nails it when he's talking about fiber being converted into those short chain fats like butyrate. These short chain fats then can interact with our intestinal cells, what we alluded to at the beginning of the video. Now, he might have a point that butyrate could be converted to ketones and offer some benefit through that mechanism. However, it would be incorrect to say this is the only possible mechanism for a number of reasons, stemming from this scientific review along with other literature that I've gone over before. One, the mechanisms around butyrate coming from the microbiome are still being worked out. So we can't say that the one mechanism is the mechanism if we don't even know all the mechanisms. Two, there have been in vitro or cell studies investigating the role of butyrate on intestinal cells along with liver cells and many other types of cells and they point to a direct effect of butyrate on the cells so not by butyrate's conversion to ketones and then an effect but rather butyrate binding to or being absorbed directly into the cell and causing epigenetic changes which is a detailed discussion for another time the point being, butyrate has effects independent of ketones, so it would be incorrect to dismiss the microbiome derived butyrate as merely a ketone effect. But that leaves one outstanding issue. Isn't it true that some people improve their constipation and their gut health by reducing their fiber intake? I mean, we went over one study, and although it wasn't the greatest quality, I did mention that I believe it to be true. So what gives? Well, I'm not going to sit here and pretend to know all the answers because we simply would need more data beyond this one study to date. But it is possible that the type of fiber matters, insoluble versus soluble. 
It also may be a mere fact of nuance, which is so often the case. As in, some people benefit from less fiber, even if most people benefit from a healthy dose of fiber. And, of course, too much fiber can also cause issues simply because too much of anything causes issues. There's certainly a nuanced conversation to be had that I hope that the science can tease out in the future. For now, I have to largely disagree with Dr. Mason, and I hope that context applied, you feel a bit more confident about the fiber discussion. I'd highly recommend some of my other content, if I may biasly say. And with that, it's been a pleasure to speak with you. Until the next one, bye. Thank mm-hmm. you.